<laughs> Welcome back to part three of starting your own metery. This is a walkthrough, a guide from our uh, lovely host, Billy Belts of Lost Cause Metery. He himself is uh, a metery owner, a very um, successful metery, metery owner, I will say. And uh, they are a metery that does things from low ABV sparkling sessions all the way to the the bombshells of 20 20 plus percenters so he has experience uh doing all of that he's walking us through specifically in this episode about licensures some building stuff as you're anticipating what you're going to do with your building and then also more about equipment if you have not listened to the first two which was the first part was all about the business model you should go back and listen to that very important we then talked about the business plan and how to get funding, and we're here now. So, Billy, thank you for uh, enlightening us, and uh, welcome. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah, good to be here. Uh, so, talk about licensures. I know that that was the first thing I heard whenever I first considered what I would want to do with a metery. People were like, well, make sure you get your licensures in order. And then I heard a bunch of lists of things, and I was like, oh, that's a lot more in depth than I realized. So what's going on there? Yeah, it's um, it's a necessary evil in this industry. And um, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's such a small part of getting to launch, opening a metery. Um, so it is one of the first things you have to do, but um, it's it's really in terms of cost and hours, it's it's nothing compared to everything else that's coming. So, um, uh, you know, don't get too overwhelmed. The hardest thing with licensure is finding that, figuring out like what to do because mm -hmm. the the government does not um, make it easy to understand. So, really, you're going to need um, uh, a few different licenses, right? You're going to need um, federal TTB licensure, which is a, a um, uh, a winery license, an O2 license. So as a metery, you will be applying as an O2 um, in, in most cases. And uh, some, some things, well, I'll come back to what that means. Then you'll also need um, your state alcohol license. For us in California, it's the ABC. Every state is different. Um, they're, they can be not a lot of fun to work with as well, or they can be super supportive. It kind of ranges, um, but they will have their own set of rules. Whereas federally, we're, we all have the same rules. They really vary state to state. So no matter what anyone tells you, make sure they are talking about your state licensure when, when it gets to that uh, level. And then uh, city or town or county, wherever you are, um, you know, you'll need like a business license and, and that's usually pretty easy. And um, hopefully local uh, uh, government's the easiest and most fun to work with. Um, uh, but yeah, not, none, of, none of them are, are a breeze. Um, some things to consider when you're getting your federal license. Uh, TTB in order to apply. And there's a whole packet of things you have to put together. And it's a, it's a lot. But again, nothing compared to like everything else you need to, to open the business. Um, they require a lease. And we talked about this in the last uh, uh, video. So that means you have to have a signed lease on a space in order to apply for a TTB license. Um, unless anything has changed in the last few years and, and no one told me. That's, that's a requirement. And so... That can mean a lot in terms of budget, um, you know, and uh, if if um, you have to be paying rent on a space before you can even make meat in it um, and, and you have to wait for approval from the TTB for months before you can even get approval to make meat, uh, that's going to drain, you know, your budget. And you just have to be uh, you have to know that you have to be ready for that. Um now, uh, a trick here, a little hack that um, we used that sped it up from at the time. I think it's a little quicker now. At the time in 2017, it was an average of six months to get approval. Um, and we shortened it to about uh, seven weeks, I think. Um, wow. 
And uh, we did that by reaching out to our local uh, politicians. So our um, our local congresswoman uh, for the, the district that the business was in, um, you know, every politician wants to be seen as supporting small businesses. There's, there's, unless they're a complete ass, there's like, that's, that's a layup for them. So if you give them that opportunity, they'll take it. So as soon as you apply, reach out and say, Hey, I have, I'm apply, I've applied for this license and a wine license. Um, you know, the average time is this long. I'm worried I won't be able to make it. Is there anything you can do? Hmm. Um, in our case, and in most cases, they'll be like, oh, yeah, we do this all the time. And they just send in a form and suddenly you get moved to the uh, the top of the list. So use your politicians. They're not good for anything else. So you might as well get something out of them. Um, and, uh, and they can really help here, hmm. really help. Same thing on the state level. Um, now, state can be, again, every state is different. Um, for our state, uh, they required that the build out of the space be signed off by the city before the state would provide their license. So we actually got our TTB license before state because we had to have the building completely done. Um, the inspectors come in, everything is this, 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 um, all the ridiculous things that you have to do. And then the city signs off. Then you go back to um, the state and then they gave us our alcohol license. Um Things to remember, the federal, the TTB, they care about how your wine is made and where. Mm. And when you have something that's tax paid or not, right? Have you pulled it out of bond and paid a tax on it or not? The state, they don't require or they don't care as much about how it's made. They require how it's sold. So they're more focused on the tasting room. What area is licensed to sell? What mm. isn't? Um, how is it being sold? And so you kind of, when you're doing it, you're, you'll be like creating these diagrams for each. For federal, they want to know where are you making it and how? How's the space built out? Where are you storing it? States more, where is it being sold from? Where is your point of sale? Where is Where can it not be sold um, in, in, your, in your facility? So, and then city, usually way easier than in those first two. They just, you know, uh, business license. Now a city will come in when you have to, if you're doing a build out. Mm. And this is where it really depends on on where you are. Uh, believe it or not, California, there's a lot of benefits to being a winery in California. I know people think, oh, it's kind of hard to start a business here. Actually, as a winery, it's it's fantastic because we we the wine industry here is, is so big. We have a lot of perks. Uh, but one thing that is difficult is um, getting a, like a build out approved through in our case, San Diego um, had to jump through a lot of hoops, get a lot of things paid for. You may be in a smaller town or a county where all you have to do is go downtown, show them, um, you know, a, a diagram that you drew, and they're like, "Yeah, sure, that's that's mm -hmm. fine." And so there, there's kind of extremes, right? And but you need to know where you'll be because that's going to take a big chunk of your budget. Is what does the city or county require? of your facility build out? Do they require professional architectural, architectural mm -hmm. drawings and all these other things? And, um, uh, or, or is it gonna be a little easier, mm -hmm. you know, to slide through? So that's uh, that's pretty much everything. The only thing I'll say is you do not need to pay a consultant to fill out your TTB uh, license. Mm -hmm. Some meteries have um, nothing wrong with it. It's unnecessary. It's so yeah. it, it, it's just you just got to figure out what to do. But once you get there, it, it's not hard to to put together everything they need at all. So don't spend your money on a consultant. Yeah, I've always heard everything you just said about the TTB, especially the the timeline. It's always uh, from my friends who have walked through the process. They're like, I'm still waiting, blah, blah, blah. And so. That's a good little uh, hack <laughs> to see if you can speed that process up. Because I'm sure it's frustrating when you're sitting just kind of watching paint dry, so to speak. Oh, man. Yeah. And, you know, it's it just needs to get stamped. It's just sitting there, right, in, in a pile. Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as a business owner, use your, your local politicians for everything you can. Hmm. It will come up in the city. Um Something comes up and uh, you're having difficulty, like in our case, we're getting construction project done right next to us. And we're losing parking, all this stuff. And I can go to my local council person 
they'll put pressure on the mayor and then we, you know, we get some things at least not fixed, but at least to work in our help us out a little. So politicians at the federal, state and local level, they can't help because everyone wants to support small businesses. Right. We'll put them to work. We'll get up, make sure they're doing stuff. (laughs) So (laughs) let's talk about once we've got our licensure, let's say that we, well, actually it's, it's both, you know, Maybe we haven't got our licensure and we're looking for the building side of things. What are we considering here? The building, equipment, obviously these two go hand in hand. Like you said, the TTB wants you to have that building before you do get your actual, even apply for the license. So what are some factors for us to anticipate when going forward? Yeah, um, so a lot of this comes back to the first video we did about business model that will dictate a lot of what what kind of building you get what needs you have so you have to have that figured out once you have that um things to look out for uh location Mm -hmm. right so this is a big one because location will dictate cost of of the lease or if you're lucky enough to to buy um which is which is a smart thing to do if you can afford it um so If you are doing a, if you're going to be a heavy tasting room model, right? Location's a huge deal. If you're mostly doing distribution, um, you should probably look for the cheapest area you can uh, because no one at the the supermarket or the bottle shop or the restaurant cares where your warehouse is. Um, But if you need uh, tasting room revenue, then then people do care because they got to go there. Um, so that's a big thing, uh, is, as much as you can get retail, like drive by traffic or walkability better, that's kind of an obvious one, but, um, just know this, no one likes your, will like your business or your product as much as you do. Mm. So don't assume everyone's going to flock there just because you're, you're super stoked on it. So you know, if you are going to um, get a space, a building in an area that is off the beaten path, you can absolutely make it work. Um, and you just have to know you're making it a destination. So you have to have a draw there. And if you and, and there's a lot of ways to do that. But if you can do that, you can succeed. If you're not will, if you're not, you know, up to that task, then you're going to struggle. Um, and uh, so. Size is another thing. Um, you know, if you're doing distribution, you're just going to need to make more mead than if you were relying mostly on tasting room. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really depends. I don't want to, I hate to throw out numbers, but like for most meteries, two to 3,000 square feet is a good starting point. Um, if you're in an area where land is cheap, go bigger. Um If you're only doing, you know, really small batch stuff, uh, uh, all tasting room and, um, you know, maybe you you can go uh, smaller or another kind of hack here is um, if you can get outdoor space, depends on where you live, right? I guess I'm saying this, I'm in San Diego, maybe it doesn't apply everywhere, but um, outdoor space is usually way cheaper if they charge you at all for it. A lot of times Mm. a landlord is just charging you for square footage of building. So if you can get a building, let's say, um, you know, half of the property is outdoor space and you don't need it for a parking lot and you can use it to put picnic tables out in the spring, summer, you know, early fall, you you can fit a lot of people out there. Um, That is going to be a huge benefit rather than fitting everyone inside because Everyone inside means you're paying for every square foot of space. Um, uh, zoning is going to be a huge thing. So like in San Diego, um, a winery is considered light industrial. Hmm. So we can't be in a lot of areas that are retail or walkable because they're not zoned for industrial use. Interesting. Um, hmm. So that, that comes down to the city. You have to know what does the city, you know, see whatever your license, like an O2 license, a wine license, how does the city or, or county view that? And then what zoning are you able to be in? That's kind of the first thing to know. Um, and, and that's why a lot of, you know, you see breweries in like business parks and industrial areas. Um, it's 
cheaper, but it's also the only place they can be. Mm. Uh, so um, you can also sp- like split it up. Uh, there's, you know, the wine, urban winery model sometimes where um, maybe you have a uh, production facility in a warehouse where it's cheap and then you have a tiny little tasting room downtown. Um, that's that's an option too. It, it requires two build outs, but that can actually be a, a great strategy. Yeah. If you if you know that taste room is going to be in a spot that's going to get a lot of traffic. How does um, that how does that work with TTB? Let's say you that's your beginning plan. Um, does that change anything if you have that already in the works? Like having two different locations. Like, would you have to have the the build out of maybe I, I'm asking a wrong question to you specifically, but would you have to have the build out of both of them done in order to start production in the production facility, but not necessarily the pouring? Tasting no, because this this is where it's almost nice that the federal and state focus on different things. So um, TTB is going to care about where you make it. Oh, okay. So so yeah, if you have a production facility, if you ha- don't even have a tasting room ready to go that's fine um you uh if i'm remembering this correctly um you you know you're gonna be able to start making mead and get get ttb approval the state's going to care more about where it's sold and they're going to be the ones that have the rules how many um can you have a satellite tasting room how many can you have i mean there's states where you can't have a satellite tasting room that's not attached to production if you're a winery Hmm. so it really depends there on on state licensure. Interesting. Um, yeah. So so you have to know state rules in order to know what is even available to you. Um, other things, tent control. Uh, understand what that means in terms of where you're going to be making your mead. Um, if you're having a glycol system, uh, you know, are you going to be able to put the glycol system on the roof, or is it going to have to be inside? Um, if you are doing ambient, what does that mean in terms of where your space is and what you need for a temp controlled room? Um, and then just in general, if you're gonna have a barrel program, mm. you know, are you in a space where you're gonna need full HVAC and temp control or um or not? And even in San Diego, it makes a big difference. Are the the um, you know, in August, it's uh 90 degrees up in our first space and it may be 75 down here because we're closer to the coast here and we're just a little inland up there. Um, and it just, you know, we get the coastal breeze here. That makes a difference for our barrel program and, and what we can do or, or not, you know? So, yeah. um, so that's a consideration. And then um, a big one obviously is coming back to your business model are you going to have a tasting room and how much of that tasting room is part of your, yeah. um, your, your, you know, your revenue stream. If it's a big part, that's going to dictate what kind of space you want to get. Um, I, and this should be kind of obvious. Just think about what kind of experience you want to create. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, are you, are you going to really focus on a, a nice tasting room or is it going to be more like, uh, a, a movable bar set up right outside the production facility. Hmm. You can make either work, but it depends on what, what you're going for. Yeah. So we've, we've already kind of talked about equipment in uh, the last episode. You know, we, we dipped our toes into what we're looking for. And again, I feel like these are always just, they're just pointing back to each other. It's like, well, we're referencing, you know, stuff from, Part one, you know, the business models applying to this specific thing here. And I think we're doing a good job of building it up. But is there anything that you want to add to the equipment side that you don't feel like we've already stated maybe in, in the last episode? Um, yeah, let's see. We've talked about plastic versus stainless a lot. Um, a big thing is how will your meats be packaged? Mm. So, um, you know, for let's say you're going to bottle everything you can do that relative like like low capital investment um wine you know still wine bottling machines like a four head bottling machine um you can get for a great one for 1500 bucks online two two grand and um it's the same one that the wineries in 
you know, your, your town will be using, uh, there's a lot of options there. That's great. Um, and then you just need bottles and mm-hmm. meat and boom. Uh, we use a, a vacuum bottler. We got um, uh, from brand in Italy. I think we got it off, um, well, someplace online. There's there's going to be options for a forehead bottler. We, we um, liked the vacuum filler over like a gravity filler. Uh, it just protects from oxidation a little better. How does that work? But then, what's that? How does the how does the vacuum filler work? That sounds interesting. Uh, it just like it sounds. It pulls a vacuum, so it's oh. pulling pulling the the um, product and then um, uh, pulling a vacuum out of the bottle and then filling it. It's basically pulling it into the bottle, right? Oh, okay. I, I'm seeing what you're saying. Now. Okay, I follow you. I've, I feel yeah. like I've seen one of them before. That it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, and then the gravity fillers like got the big tray, the trough up yeah. top. Um, it, either is going to work fine. We just yeah. we like the gravity filler. I, I'm a big uh, believer in protecting, especially meat, so expensive yeah. uh, to make. You know, protect it every single point along the way, and your equipment will go along. You know, will dictate how much you can protect it. So, um, and maybe I should mention that if we. Go all the way back to the beginning of understanding what kind of equipment you need. Um, this is maybe something I assume everyone knows, but every everything needs a sanitary fitting. So the 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 fittings you're using at the homebrew level um, are different than what you'll use at the commercial level. So everything is going to need to be tri clamp, mm. um, and uh, and that includes even if you're using plastic tanks or a, um, or a bottle filler or a water filter, you have to fit everything to fit a tri clamp or you should, um, you don't want anything that's like threaded mm. where things can build up and live. Um, and so just, just know that it, it, and as you start, it'll become quickly obvious that there's, there is, a, you have the ability to do that for everything. You just have to make sure you, you find that equipment and use it. Um, But going back to packaging, let's say you want to do uh, canned draft meats, Mm. right? That's going to take a lot more money. It's great. Uh, You'll probably, you know, be be pretty popular with what people are are looking for on the shelves right now. But um, so you are going to need to have the ability to carbonate uh, that that mead, bright tank, like all chiller, unless you're you're can conditioning and keeping it bone dry. Mm. And then... um, a canning machine. Now those are not cheap and there are not a lot of great options at the smaller level. Like there are, um, wine bottling machines, mm-hmm. uh, canning machines. There's just, the industry hasn't caught up. Um, the manufacturers haven't caught up to where, you know, now there's tons of small breweries all wanting to can, but there's, there's just not the options out there. So you may be paying, um, I mean, even for like a little tabletop canner, you might be paying, 20, 30 grand. Uh, and it's not canning very quickly. So I've seen, I've seen uh, those lines They're the ones I've seen that are really big, or at least what I've heard, um, they always have problems because there's, you know, there's lots of little things that can go wrong with cans. I've also heard that you can, I keep saying the word can, you can rent a canning machine too as well like instead of feeling like you have to buy it you can just rent one or or i don't know what the terminology is there but you can rent it for that that little time you need it and then do that instead of paying the however much it is to get a legit crazy one totally yeah you can rent you can uh, depending on where you you live yeah. um you you might have a mobile canning option um you also have the option of canning at make friends with local breweries and um uh, bring your stuff over there and can. Mm-hmm. Um, we've uh, we haven't done that. We don't we don't uh, can we don't prefill can. But um, like the cidery that we we started with, um, they go over and can at a brewery every week, and and it's you know helps the brewery. They get paid a little bit when they're mm-hmm. not using the canning machine. Um, and it's, I'm glad you brought up the the mobile canning option because you can also use that for bottling. Um, there's a great meadery up in Washington. Um, Howard and they uh, bring in a mobile bottler and that's actually pretty common in the wine world and it works if you have like big tanks big batches to bottle yeah um and so so that's an option 
The other option for canning, so what we do is we we bottle everything, but we offer a can on demand um, option for people. So they come in, they have one of our draft meads, they really, really like it, they want to bring it home. We have a crowler machine, you know, that's a, a 1200 bucks. And um, so we can uh, 16 ounce crowlers for them and they get to take cans home. And for us, it, you know, there's no capital investment. We just do it on demand. So that's also another option um, uh, for uh, for canning. And then um, uh, let's say, I guess another part of packaging would be uh, kegging and pouring on, on tap. And um, for that, you know, you're going to need kegs, you're going to need a, a walk-in cooler, you're going to need a, a, a tap system. But if you're doing a taste room, you should you should be investing in that anyways. Um, and, uh, uh, and or if you're doing distribution and you're just getting kegs out there, you have a few options. You can go stainless steel kegs and track them. Um, you can buy kegs, uh, buy them used if you can. Uh, plenty of options for that or do a keg lease, or you can do like one time, um, one, one use kegs, mm -hmm. which there's meteries here in San Diego that do that. And then you don't have to worry about getting the, the keg back. Um, so those are kind of your packaging options. Um, we don't need to get into the weeds about labeling and, and closures and all that. Yeah. Well, I've seen those one use kegs actually, they're really interesting. Um, I don't know how feasible, obviously they're big old plastic things. So not great for the environment, but the single use thing does seem interesting on that end. Um, yeah. Is there, so is there anything we missed in, in licensure side, building equipment? Is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, equipment by, by you always look for used first. Um, and, uh, I guess one thing that a lot of mead maker, a lot of questions we get mm -hmm. is around uh, mixing the honey. Uh, mm. Cause that's one thing where it's easy at home. Right. And then you, you scale up you're like, how am I going to mix these drums with water and, and get it in the tank? There's a tons of options. Um, we keep it simple. We do like a research system. So if you think about have the tank and it's, and it's full of, of water, mm -hmm. um, let's say we're making a traditional. Okay. Um, so it's full of water and then we have our honey. Um, we have like an open tank and we do a recirc. So uh, hook up hoses. So the uh, mead is, is gravity flowing out of the tank into this open tank. Mm. And then the bottom of the open tank, it's getting pumped back up into mm. uh, the racking arm of the big tank. So it's creating this recirc, right? And this, the water splashing over into this open tank and then getting sucked back in. And then you just, you, you're, you're dumping your honey in that, mixing it. And that is mixing honey. And you don't have to um, heat the water at all. Hmm. Uh, it's it's going to mix it just fine. You need the right pump for that. Um, so we have a variable capacity um, uh, pump that is like a, a two-inch um like must pump and, uh, and that, um, variable capacity is not the word, um, variable speed. Uh, oh, this is embarrassing. I, I uh, can't think of the style pump it is right now. That's okay. how removed I've, I've been from production lately, but, um, uh, you have options in terms of pump, uh, uh the pump style that you get, mm. whatever you, you, you get for, mixing honey, you just need to make sure. It's a flex impeller, that's what I meant. Uh, uh, flex impeller pump, those work great for mixing um, uh, meads and uh, uh, mixing honey and water and actually you know, not getting gunked up or stuck or something like that. That is something I've thought about. When you have a thousand pounds of honey, it's like, man, it's a lot of honey. You know? <laughs> You're right, five pounds at home or 20 pounds at home, that's easy. I cannot imagine. Yeah. But but you don't need like some people think you need a big mixing tank with like a oh yeah rotary mixer Whirlpool, or something yeah. yeah you don't you don't need that hmm. okay well so we've talked about so far yeah uh, part one if you didn't go and listen to it you need to go back it is all about your business model part two we talked about the business plan and the funding in this episode we've talked about licensures 
the building itself that as you detail around it and the equipment you need. In the next one we're going to record and talk about, we're getting into the recipe development side, uh, sourcing ingredients. We've talked a little bit about packaging with some stuff, but we're going to get a little bit deeper with it with some of that. So Billy, thank you again for imparting great knowledge on us. We've had, uh, I've learned a lot in just this time as I'm, my wheels are spinning, um, which is a, a great thing. I'm getting excited about starting my own world, but I am very interested to hear the next one. So um, of course, I've not said this in the previous ones, but I will be putting links below to Lost Cause if you have not already checked them out. Uh, you get to try Billy's meads that he's talked about. He is, again, a world famous mead maker. They make a lot of great stuff. So Billy, thank you for taking some time and talking to us about some of this. Cheers.